everyone. Thanks for joining. I see a bunch of people connecting to audio still. So I'll give everyone just a few minutes here, a few seconds, I should say. Awesome. Welcome. here looks like they're connected to audio. Thank you everyone for joining Ask the Alliance today. Um, today we are um, digging in with, with Ryan to talk about trees. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, I just want to share a little bit about the Alliance. Uh, the Alliance is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to bring together communities, companies, and conservationists to improve our lands and waters in the Chesapeake Bay. Last summer, the Alliance hosted its first live talk webinar series, which we actually called Breakfast on the Bay, where we were able to unite our staff expertise with our partners experience to explore the impact we have on the Chesapeake Bay's health. As our staff continues to grow at the Alliance, our expertise does too. So this year, we really wanted our staff to be able to share their knowledge and passion with you for what you can do either at home um, or enjoy to help improve the health of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And today you'll have the opportunity to ask the Alliance. Uh, so I just wanna do some really quick housekeeping stuff with the hope for these sessions to be interactive. Feel free to join us with your camera turned on, but please remain on mute. You will have the opportunity to ask questions throughout. You can um, leave them in the chat. I'll certainly be sharing those with Brian at the end of our session. Um, and you also can ask questions at, at the very end, as I mentioned. Um, and then with that, today I'm excited to welcome and introduce Ryan Davis. He's our Senior Forest Projects Manager up in our Pennsylvania office. Um, today he's going to share all about how you can identify numerous tree species throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So Ryan, I will pass that over to you. All right, wonderful. Thanks, Lauren, and thanks everybody for, uh, for showing up here. Hope you have good lunches ready um, to be uh, munching on while I'm talking. So. Get my screen set up here. Um, Lauren, can you confirm uh, that I'm in presentation yep, mode? Yep, yep, Great, wonderful. Great, okay, now I'm gonna get my timer ready because I talk too much, which everybody who knows me knows. Um, okay, so let's get on into it. Tree identification um, and for any season and any place. So um, my task here today is I have 45 minutes maybe closer to 30 if we're gonna leave lots of time for questions for me to teach you how to identify trees. Um, but that's a big task. So what I'm gonna kind of focus on is um, how to, teaching you how to learn how to identify trees. So I'm gonna run through kind of the process that you can plug yourself into wherever your current uh, expertise level is um, to keep learning more and more about these wonderful, wonderful plants. Um, Okay, so Lauren already talked about it a little bit. Um, who are we, the Alliance? You know, you already know us because you're here. You, you heard about Ask the Alliance, so you know who the Alliance is. So we cover the whole Bay watershed. We are obviously uh, very focused on restoring the Chesapeake Bay, but how we do that is, is we do it uh, mostly in the watershed itself. So we're working with all the communities who are here, the landowners who are here, um, everybody who's here to uh, try to work together uh, to improve this um, fantastic resource. Um, and by working up here in the watershed, it's kind of a double duty. We are improving things here um, and then thereby improving the bay because water is eventually going to get in there, uh, as we all know, for better or for worse. Um, we have four sort of pillars of our work, four program teams is how we kind of identify ourselves at the Alliance. So I am on our forest team um, and we have agriculture, green infrastructure, and stewardship and engagement. And just like how we partner with everybody, um, up here while we're doing our work, we actually really interface close together um, with all these program teams. I mean, trees are a part of all of these four program areas. Um, and so for instance, uh, we plant a lot of riparian forest buffers on agricultural land. Here's a picture of one um, with my stinky little dog, Newt. Um, she will be in this presentation a handful of times. I uh, am now in our office, but for a couple of years there, I was giving these presentations from home and I wanted to show her face because he probably would hear her voice um, at some point during the presentation, but not today, sorry. Um, but uh, so what do we do on the forest program? So our job is pretty simple. We're trying to increase the quantity of forest cover in the Bay watershed. So that's by reforestation. You can see here, tree planting site. We have our trees in those little deer shelters um, and then increasing the quality of forest cover in the Bay watershed. Um, so that is through forest management. We do a lot of education and outreach to help people figure out what they need to do. We have a couple uh, programs where we, we 
actively work to help landowners improve their own woods, um, which is really cool, exciting stuff too. Um, and then increasing the stewardship uh, of everybody here in the watershed towards forests. I like to say that everybody loves trees, they might just not know it yet. So our job is for them is to help them figure out that they do love trees and that they want to take care of them and that they want there to be more trees. Um, and you know, in the future, uh, we'll all be happier and healthier because of it. So uh, real quick, a couple things, you know, some plugs before I get in. And Lauren, if you wouldn't mind dropping a link to the newsletter page, I think that'll be an easier way to see it. So um, if you want to keep up with us, I think again, um, y'all must be keeping up with us somehow whether on social media or one of these uh, newsletters or something. Um, but we have two awesome newsletters. We actually have a third one that's focused on local government. So sorry that I didn't put that in there, local government team. Uh, but it, again, very focused on local government. So um, on the left there, we have uh, what's called the Confluence. Um, a great name. I love that name. Um, it's all about kind of everything going on in the watershed, all of our work here at the Alliance. And so that's a little bit more general. If you're just kind of interested in general, you know, anything to do with the Bay Conservation, that's a great uh, great newsletter for you. And then Forest for the Bay is very, very focused on forests. Um, and it's more of an educational newsletter. Um, uh, we also do have, you know, events and, you know, links to other articles and stuff, but um, it's mostly uh, something that we, we do every month to just, you know, teach people about woods. Um, so, and now is a great time to sign up because we have a special edition of Forest for the Bay called Forest for the Bats that we do every uh, spooky Halloween season. It comes out on Halloween day every year where we write original articles about the creepiest parts of our Chesapeake watershed. So, you know, sign up or, or uh, beware. Um, okay, yes, sorry, I'm so, I'm so bad at remembering these. This is why I have to have these slides in here. Um, one more plug, um, if you like hearing me talk about trees, well, we have a whole YouTube series um, called Tree Talk uh, where I talk about trees. So basically go through identification, natural history for um, all the species. If you're learning tree identification, it, this is a good way to do it um, on days when you can't get out there and, and look yourselves. Um, or it might be something you can pull up on your phone and, you know, um, look as you're trying to identify stuff potentially. And I do want to highlight, in addition to Tree Talk, we actually just started a new series uh, called Habit Chats, where um, we are more looking at uh, kind of more broad ecology, uh, wildlife habitat, that kind of stuff, um, rather than just individual plant species. So that's a really cool one um, if you want to learn more there. Um, and how to get to that, just go to YouTube, uh, Forest for the Bay, and um, uh, subscribe if you want to get the monthly um, releases. Uh, okay, great. We're here. We did it. We got through the front stuff. Um, so you're all here because you want to uh, get a little bit better at identifying trees. Um, so, you know, I'm preaching to the choir, but hey, we're usually preaching to the choir when people come to, you know, educational workshops. Um, so you all know that it's important to be able to identify trees, um, but this is a great example I like to use for why it's really, really, really important to know um, what your species are. So even if you're not, you know, trying to manage land yourself, you know, these are really important things to know. So these three species have a tendency to get confused by people. Um, people can see them from a distance, um, sometimes even including myself from a distance, it can be hard to tell um, what these guys are, how to tell them apart. Um, but there are three very different species that have very different implications for management. So in the top left, we have Ailanthus altissima, tree of heaven, a very, very nasty invasive plant that um, everybody hates for good reason. It's terrible. Um, then on the right, we have Roost typhina, staghorn sumac, which is an awesome small tree, great for pollinators, great for wildlife, but it gets killed all the time because people think that it is um, tree of heaven. Um, conversely, people let tree of heaven go because they think it's staghorn sumac, or they think it's the one at the bottom, walnut, black walnut. Black walnut is a really, really valuable timber species, really, really valuable for wildlife. It's an excellent canopy tree species. Um, so, you know, all these species, you need to know how to manage. Um, you need to know what you're looking at. Um, and if you just, if you kind of have a very casual, you know, tree identification acumen, you can start to sort of see some, some clear differences in these. Um, but that's what it's all about, is, is understanding what you're looking at. And, and, and that matters because all of these plant species are different. So I do want to include this. This is from years ago, um, uh, just giving a, like an invasive plant talk or something. And I was trying to find pictures of um, Tree of Heaven versus, you know, Roost Typhina, Staghorn Sumac. And this site here, you can see it's plantsamerica.com, some like educational, you know, they have a bunch of galleries of, of native plants. Um, and they labeled this as Roost Typhina, Staghorn Sumac, and it is not. This is clearly tree of heaven. Um, there are a couple things I could point out here uh, to indicate that this is tree of heaven in this little grove. Um, you have these pinkish, I'm not sure if the mouse 
pointer showing up, but whether it is or not, at the tips, the new growth is kind of a pinkish hue. Um, then if we look at the leaf itself, they, the margins are not serrated, they're smooth, and then they have these little nubs towards the base of the leaflets. Um, so this is very clearly tree of heaven. Um, so I, I want to include this because, you know, don't worry, even people who are, you know, um, ostensibly experts in, in plant identification are occasionally getting it wrong. Um, so uh, it's okay for you to get it wrong occasionally too. And it's okay for me to get it wrong, uh, even more important. Um, so uh, this is a, a drum that I will beat for the remainder of these 45 minutes or so that you know, yes, learning your tree identification by leaf is awesome. Definitely do it. Um, but that's only going to help you six months out of the year. The rest of the time, you're going to need to look at your other clues. Um, and bark is my preferred way to identify um, plants, partly because I've done so many bird related jobs that, you know, my neck is not as good as it used to be. I'm used to looking up into the canopy for leaves and birds. And ah, that's too much of a pain. I want to look at you know, um, about five feet off the ground where my eyes are. Um, and I want to look at that bark right there in front of me. So we're going to talk about this a little bit, how to kind of parse out uh, differences and how to get a little bit better at your bark identification. Um, but these are those three exact same species. So um, one of the top things that you can do to start improving your identification of anything is, is trying to figure out what details to look for. Um, so with this bark here, I'll just kind of describe these three species and, and so thereby you can kind of see what I'm looking at. The one on the left, that's our tree of heaven, has these very distinctive furrows. Um, so a lot of bark, uh, as the tree is growing in diameter, it's going to split into ridges and valleys or furrows. Um, with tree of heaven, those ridges and furrows are still quite smooth. The bark is really smooth and the furrows themselves have this kind of stretch mark sort of kind of texture, um, like, like, you know, stretch marks on human skin. And that's kind of what they are in the bark really is as the tree is growing, you know, the, the um, it's uh, performing a little bit different. The one in the middle there also has ridges and furrows. That's our black walnut, but you can see it's really quirky. Um, those ridges are really raised um, and the furrows are not smooth at all. So very, very different there. And actually that tree is probably only, you know, uh, maybe sort of my arm in diameter. Uh, that's probably a pretty small one. They get texture very, very quickly, um, which is important to note too. And as you learn the trees better, you will learn to identify them at different stages a little bit better too. Um, and then the one on the right there is of course the last one left, Roost Typhina, Staghorn Sumac. So the thing that sticks out to me here is we have quite smooth bark that is um, punctuated by all of these little warts. Um, those are called lenticels. They are gas exchange pores. So basically just the cell tissue is kind of bigger and wider there. So there's more space in between the cells for gases, carbon dioxide and oxygen mostly, to be exchanged in and out of the plant. That's an adaptation frequently to poor soil. Um, a lot of species that um, you know, will survive in poor soil will have those, um, and a lot of species that grow pretty fast. Um, so it's a unique adaptation and something that we can use pretty frequently to help with our identification. Um, so um, again, uh, you know, you, you're probably interested in learning trees. A lot of you may already know a lot of trees. I recognize a lot of names and faces that I, I was able to see in the big gallery of you. So I know, I know we got some good tree experts here already, but I like to kind of, you know, uh, this can be intimidating if you're new to it. Um, uh, people, you know, really want to learn their trees, but it all just looks green, right, or whatever. And so, you know, to encourage you, um, when you were a kid, you dogs were dogs, right? You didn't know a golden retriever from a, a, a beagle, from a pit bull, right? Um, but now you just do. You just know, likely, that we have a pit bull and a beagle here. There's Newt again on the right. Um, and you just kind of knew that. And how you knew that was because you've been looking at these for years and years and years. Um, and you've been talking about dogs and you've been thinking about dogs and you've been seeing pictures of dogs and asking people what do the dog they have. And over time, you just kind of know different dog breeds. You never sat down with a book, probably, unless you went to vet school or something to study different, you know, dog breeds, you just kind of know them. Or another analogy is cars. You just kind of, oh, yep, there's a Mazda, there's a Honda, whatever. We just kind of know it. We know what to look for. Um, we know the differences between stuff without kind of sitting down and studying it. And you can get there with trees. It just takes, you know, time and repetition over and over and over. And it also takes you paying attention. So it took me a very long time to know the difference between cars because I don't really care about cars at all. As long as they work 
and don't cost me money, I, I'm fine. I don't really care about any other details, uh, just good fuel efficiency and like just, you know, don't cause trouble. Um, but I love dogs. I care a lot more about dogs. So I knew about dog breeds and, and how to tell the difference between them and how to tell the difference between snakes and stuff like that when I was a little kid. But it wasn't until I was a teenager, kind of look at, you know, starting to drive myself that I started to know the difference between cars. So basically pay attention. You have to pay attention to these little details. You can't learn tree identification unless you look at trees all the time. Um, luckily trees are everywhere so you can practice all the time. Um, and so, uh, and another kind of word of encouragement while we're on this analogy. So yeah, you know, the pit bull and the beagle, very easy to tell apart. Um, not all trees are gonna be as easy to tell apart. Not all dogs are gonna be as easy to tell apart. So there's Newt again, the beagle on the right. Uh, and then that's a foxhound, just a, a picture I got from the internet there um, on the left. Um, so they look super, super similar, except for a couple little differences. But unless you know what differences to look for, you might say, I don't know, is it the same thing? Um, and so uh, I call, my wife and I call foxhounds tall beagles. Um, so that's our way of telling the difference is they're very leggy, look at those long legs. And then here we have the same photos of those um, you know, species. We have the uh, Ilanthus altissima there on the left and then the black walnut on the right. So we have trees that are hard to tell apart. We have dogs that are hard to tell apart. We have cars that are hard to tell apart. Um, and you can do good uh, at identifying any of them, um, if you put your mind to it and you practice. Um, so uh, how do you go about identifying trees? Let's kind of get into it. Um, I'm gonna run through all of these um, steps here, but again, I've already said it probably 10 times, you gotta pay attention to everything. You have to really look at these things and you have to really, really pay attention um, to as many little details as possible. And honestly, this is where the fun is. Um, you, by learning these species, you're not just learning them, you're getting kind of, um, familiar with them, you're getting intimate with them, you're starting to understand their properties a little bit more and what wildlife uses them and where they grow and all this kind of stuff, the ecology that that actually matters. You know, the name of the species doesn't matter as much as as what the species is and how it performs with all the other species around it. So um, by paying attention to everything, you're gonna make yourself a very, very good naturalist as well. So it's a good skill to learn. Um, with tree identification, any plants process of elimination is gonna be super valuable. We'll run through um, that. Guessing and checking is totally valid. We all have smartphones in our pockets with internet that works in most of the places we are. Um, so you can use that. Um, and and I, there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know if this is this, let me see, and Googling it and seeing if it is or not. Um, finally, we're gonna spend a lot of time working on this today, um, but use a key. Learning to use a dichotomous key is invaluable for you to be able to identify trees, but also other plants. Once you figure out how to use a key, you now have a superpower to be able to identify kind of anything that you have a key for anyway. Um, and then of course, practice, practice, practice over and over and over. And so um, I think my final non-tree analogy, um, I wanna uh, give this little example. So my, my lovely long suffering wife um, was born in a lumber yard in the backseat of an Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. Um, and uh, it was the middle of Wyoming County, PA, 1990. Uh, it was a cold May morning, um, pitch black, and uh, there, the baby was on the way. Uh, uh, little baby Allison was, was coming, and they were on the way to the hospital, and the only place they could find um, enough light to um, perform a backseat delivery was a lumber yard. So they pull into the lumber yard, have the baby, everybody's happy, healthy, everything was good. Um, but uh, this came up, you know, the story comes up every once in a while. Um, came up a couple of years ago and my father-in-law kind of got stuck on the detail of what year of Chevy Cutlass Supreme Coupe it was. Again, this is not a detail that I would have really thought about, but he's a welder and a big kind of very mechanically gifted and, and, and has a lifelong love of cars. So this is something he's been paying attention to his entire life. Now he couldn't remember if she was born in a 79 or an 80 Cutlass Supreme, but he did remember that the car she was born in only had one set of headlights. And so we could take a look at these two Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme Coupes. The one on the left here has one set of headlights. The one on the right has two sets of headlights. Um, and so we Googled it real quick and we found out that it was indeed a 79 Cutlass Supreme that she was born in. So again, this is why we have to pay attention to everything and the value of using our clues that we have and investigating them further. Um, uh, okay, so on that note of paying attention to everything, I mean everything. 
Um, I get pictures of stuff all the time saying kind of what is this um, from friends, from family, from, from work folks, everyone, all the time. If you're a tree person, you will, you will sort of magnetize yourself and people will be asking you identification uh, questions constantly. Um, so if I get this picture, I don't really have much to say. I don't know, you know, this could be many things. There are many uh, plants that this could be. Um, so but if you provide a little bit more detail, you know, we might be getting somewhere. So let's say uh, somebody sends me this picture of buddy and what is this plant? I found it in a wet area. It was on the edge of a pond. It was seven feet tall. It was June and it had white flowers. I've seen it with red fruit in the winter. That's a lot of detail, right? That's not enough detail. I don't know what that, that thing is. That could be a couple of things still. I have a couple ideas in my, in my brain of, of what that could be and still fit that description. Um, how about this though? Oh boy, in addition to those details, we have a picture that shows the reproductive structures, which are really, really helpful for, um, uh, for identification. Um, and so the flowers here in the crook of that stem, the technical term for that is, is axle, that kind of tissue between the stem and the, uh, the rachis, which is the stem of the leaf. Um, we also have these lenticels that are kind of oval shaped and we have a sort of a greenish color stem. Uh, we don't have any thorns or spurs. So this is enough information for me. This is a winterberry holly. I like Spurgis a lot. Um, so again, we have to pay attention to everything, not just everything on the leaf, everything on the entire plant form this full picture. Um, now kind of onto the process of elimination. This is more helpful once you start to know things a little bit better, um, but it's really, really invaluable once you do. Um, and so this kind of series of questions I will generally ask people who are learning trees are, first of all, you know, is it opposite or is it alternate? Is it simple? Is it compound? And we're going to get into what those words mean here in a second. But what I'm asking when I'm doing that is I'm asking people to kind of take all the trees that they know of and, you know, start throwing things out. It can't be this. It can't be this. It can't be this. And you're just eliminating down so that you either have just a couple things that you need to guess and check on or, you know, exactly what you have. So this is a great example. What is this tree? <clears throat> well, we can see here. We have compound leaves, and again, we're going to get into the definitions here, so bear with me. Um, that just means that there are multiple leaflets per leaf, um, and we have opposite leaves, meaning that there are, the leaves are opposite of each other on the stem. Um, and so there are not that many options here. We have eliminated almost everything just by very two small details uh, that we you know, need to pay attention to everything. So pretty much all trees and shrubs we've eliminated. There's only a few specimens that this could be. Um, we let's assume this is a tree. There are some other options if it was more of a shrub, um, but we have two things really: box elder, Acer nagundo, or an ash. Um, and so we could pretty easily take out our smartphones, make them good for something, um, and uh, and and Google uh, this box elder um, and find out that it is in fact box elder. Um, so again, guessing and checking. There's nothing wrong with using Google, um, and we do in fact here have Acer nagundo, box elder. Um, so let's say you do that successfully. You're in the woods, you identify something, whether it's on your phone with an app or a key or someone tells you what it is, whatever it is, now you have a foothold, but you need to use that foothold for something. You can't just say, oh, okay, box elder, and then kind of go on your merry way. Um, the rest of your hike, look for more box elders. Um, think about those box elders. Where are they growing? What do they look like? When they're young, do they look a little different? When they're huge, do they look a little different? Do they have fruits? Do they have flowers? Um, get up there, feel the leaves. Break the leaves up and smell them. Touch the bark, all sorts of things. Use all your senses. Well, maybe don't eat things uh, unless you really know what it is, but most of your senses, use most of your senses um, and just stay aware of the entire woods, not just this individual species. Um, and then the next time you're in similar habitat, look for more box elders. Now that you have started to form this search image, this is how you're going to, by just repeating and practicing and paying attention constantly, this is how you're gonna start to slowly gain that knowledge. Um, and I recommend if you found this specimen, maybe a local park might be a good place to start. Um, if you want to go there once a week or something, you know, bring your dogs, bring your kids, your, your family, whatever, um, and just maybe try to learn a species every time you go there. And every time you go there, look for that tree, that same tree that you figured out what it is. If there's a big sycamore that you're like, oh, that's definitely a sycamore, pay attention to it all year. It's going to look different throughout the year. So by paying attention to the seasonal changes, you're gonna to get to know that species a little bit better um, and you're gonna be able to find it a little bit better in the future. So practice, practice, practice. Um, now into dichotomous keys. Again, you know, they, they can be a little heady, a little kind of hard to wrap your brain around at first, but um, there is a reason they're in like every single like biology lab in every college, you have to do some dichotomous key stuff at some point. They are fundamental for identification. Um, and I'm really, really good at plant 
dichotomous keys, but I'm not great with my fungi. Um, but I picked up an awesome dichotomous key for local Pennsylvania fungi, and I can I can make my way through it because I know how to use the key. So it's a tool that I highly recommend you figure out how to use. Um, I've got some recommendations I'll kind of talk about a little bit. Um, that this Bark book is excellent for learning, well, you know, about your bark. Um, I also really like this Peterson Guide to Eastern Trees. It's kind of small um, and has good descriptions. The key is, is pretty good. Um, but yeah, the size is good. Um, I biked here to the office today and I carried it with me and didn't even bother to bring it into this room where I'm giving the presentation. So it was extra weight, but it wasn't that much weight, which is what I'm getting at. Um, so I recommend both of these keys. Um, and uh, as boring as this sounds, if you pick up a identif any identification book at all, but especially one with a dichotomous key, you have to read the introduction. You have to read it. Um, or else you're just going to be kind of flipping around and looking, and that's not a very effective way to figure these things out. Um, and this is a worthy investment. Get your new ID book, your brand new ID book. When you open it up, it has that new book smell. It's such a beautiful, beautiful tool in your hands. Sit down with your coffee or your tea in the morning on a weekend and just take an hour to, to introduce yourself to that book. And it's going to be a worthwhile investment in your time. After you figure out this stuff, the terminology, how to use these keys, you can go out and identify any plant in the whole world. So worthy, worthy investment. Um, to run through some of this terminology, this is really, really important for using these keys, but it's also um, one of the ways that we can reset our brains um, to figure out what we need to pay attention to when we're out in the woods. Because um, again, the first thing I'm going to ask people when I'm doing a, a tree ID session is, is this species alternate or opposite? Um, so what I mean here is uh, different species have different ways of arranging their leaves and their stems. Um, it's pretty clear here, the opposite one, well, the leaves are opposite of each other. And, you know, okay, this is alternate. So there's a leaf here and then it alternates. It goes to the other side instead of them being held, you know, right directly across from each other. Um, but out in the field, they're not always going to look this pretty um, or the trees you know, the leaves and the, and the stems are going to be way up high in the tree and they're kind of hard to see. So um, really what you should be thinking about is not kind of how they look, um, but, but this form. So what we call uh, the node of growth is basically the area around the buds of all plants, really. Um, but for trees, um, we're typically going to have buds, uh, which are future branches and leaves. Um, you're potentially going to have leaves there as well um, and potentially stems there. So in that node of growth, if we have an alternate species per bud, which is where the node of growth is, we're only going to have one stem or one leaf. With an opposite, we're going to have two. With world, we're going to have three. World is we have three leaves, you know, uh, et cetera, per. And there's not that many species we have here um, that have world um, leaves. So we don't have to worry about that too much. Mostly Catalba uh, and a couple, you know, Buckeye uh, type species. Um, so uh, this is really, really valuable, again, not just for, you know, starting with, with your process of elimination, but in the wintertime, when you have no leaves at all, um, this is a way for you to really quickly narrow things down. Um, so here we have our node of growth where our buds are, and we can count one, two buds or leaf scars. Um, so we know this is opposite. And this is an ash, by the way. Um, Okay, so if you have an opposite stem, and this is the primary way, again, of, of doing your process of elimination. Um, if you have opposite arrangement, um, how we say this is uh, mad ad old buck cap is the, um, the mnemonic for remembering this. This has changed substantially over the years. Um, when I was in college, um, not that long ago in the, in the aughts, um, it was not this because we've kind of changed scientific names and classifications and stuff. Um, but to run through this really quick, so the MAD is Maples, Ashes, Dogwoods, um, the ADD is Adoxaceae, which contains our viburnums and elderberry uh, plants, uh, Oleaceae is the olive family, our privets are in there, uh, Buckeyes, which um, anything in the Aesculus genus, which includes horse chestnuts, um, and then Caprifoliaceae, which is our honeysuckle. So all of these are going to have opposite leaves. Now, you may have noticed that, um, you know, a lot of this back end is shrubby stuff. So if you're looking at trees, if trees is kind of your primary focus for now, um, then you don't have to worry about all that other stuff. Just get mad. Maples, ashes, dogwoods. These are going to be your opposite species. And so we have this beautiful, beautiful sugar maple here. And you can see all over the place this evidence of these opposite branching patterns. So here we see, bam, bam, two there. We have these leaves coming out opposite of each other. Here's a great example. There's, um, you can kind of see a little nub. Um, a, a stem must have got snapped off right there. But that is indeed an opposite branch there as well. Um, 
So I already also alluded to this compound versus simple leaves. This is another massive way that we can start to eliminate um, a bunch of different species. So um, here on the left, we have a wonderful hickory, um, the sulfur yellow bud. So again, we wanna look for the buds to figure out if we are compound or simple. Um, so uh, we are not gonna find any buds in here um, in between this leaflet and the stem, uh, the rachis. Um, you're only gonna have a bud in between the stem and the leaf. So that this whole thing is one leaf and all of these are leaflets. If you went out in the woods and found a box elder and peeled off those leaflets and looked really closely, you wouldn't see anything because it's a leaflet, but you would find the bud at the base of the actual full leaf, that compound leaf. Simple leaves are simple. There's a beech, we have one bud, we have one leaf, um, easy. Um, and most plants are gonna be that simple you know, uh, uh, leaf. But again, this is a massive way for you to easily start to um, eliminate. So some more uh, terminology. Um, lobes are another important thing to look for. We have obviously, again, another sugar maple over here. Um, uh, different books will use different terms. Palmate lobing is, is probably the, the more kind of technical term, but some books will say fan lobe. And that just means, you know, palmate, well, that's kind of like your hand uh, where we have a central point and then the lobes are coming out um, of there. Um, same with, yeah, like a fan, uh, feather lobed or pinnate would be we have um, a main kind of leaf and then all the lobes come out of the sides like a feather. Um, same with the veins. So if we look at the veins in there, in this sugar maple, uh, it all starts in one central point and then they kind of array out from there like a fan or a palm. Uh, and then again, with the veins, we have central midrib here uh, and all the side veins coming off there. Um, additionally, the leaf margin is gonna be a massive identification feature for you to look for. Um, and that's just the edge of the leaf. Um, typically what you're gonna see is either smooth or entire leaves that don't have any texture on that margin at all uh, or dentate, which is toothed. Um, or serrate, which is serrated. Uh, but you'll see all sorts of other stuff out there. And then another kind of fun thing, so denticulate, uh, that U-L-A-T-E um, suffix, um, basically means tiny. So uh, like a like an ita, ito in Spanish. So dentate, um, denticulate means tiny, tiny, tiny little teeth, or serulate means tiny, tiny, tiny little serrations. Um, so another really important thing to look at. I think I even, this is how I told the difference between that sumac and the black um, or the um, the black walnut and the uh, ailanthus earlier. Um, okay, so let's get into the keys a little bit. Um, I've done this a couple times via webinar running through the keys. Um, I, so I, I, I don't think it's too boring. I hope it's not. It won't take too long. I promise if it is boring, we'll get through it together. Um, but really important. Again, this is an investment um, even if it's a boring investment, it's still a great investment in your future knowledge. So um, this is out of the Peterson Guide, which I bought, brought all the way here so that I could hold it up right now. And here we are. Um, but we're going to practice again with that box elder because it's easier to learn things, to practice things if we already know the answer, right? Kind of like uh, working backwards. So, so we've got our box elder here. Um, how you use a dichotomous key is you start with question one. You see if that question uh, or category applies to the specimen you have. If it doesn't, we move on. So we'll start with number one here. Uh, does our specimen have needle-like or scale-like leaves and is mostly evergreen? No, that does not apply to us. We do not have scales or needles here at all. So what do we do? We move on to the next question. So we'll go on to this category here. Uh, so broad leaves trees with opposite compound leaves. Well. I think, yes, we do, we do have that. Um, so let's then go into this whole category. Let's see what's at the first option. If that doesn't apply, we'll move on to the next and the next and the next until we find what we're looking at. And speaking of process of elimination, how these keys work is they have already bottled up that process of elimination for us. So they are starting with the simplest stuff to <clears throat> eliminate and then going from there. It's really, really easy to say all the conifers. Is this a conifer? If it's not a conifer, go over there. If it's a conifer, we'll start there. So we've eliminated, if it has needles or scale-like leaves, we've eliminated all broad leaves, all deciduous trees. So let's just start there with those. So it's getting more complicated um, as we move on and more um, sort of abundant. You're gonna have more species as we move further down this list. Um, so, but luckily the key has already done all of that elimination for us. Um, so we'll look at the first option here. So that says trees with opposite and compound leaves, I covered it up, I can't read it. Um, but that's what this means. Uh, here's a buckeye leaf 
a fan compound. It is opposite, but it's not the right kind of compound. We have a pinnately compound box elder leaf over here, right? So, um, so that's not it. So what we'll do is we'll move on to the next section. So we'll flip the page there. Um, small trees with opposite compound leaves, bladder nut and elderberry. Um, well, let's pretend this guy again is a tree. Is you know it's a box elder. It's a big old tree. Um, so it's not going to be that plate. So we'll move on to the next category. Trees with opposite feather compound leaves. Um, well, yeah, that does apply. And so we know that it's a box elder and not an ash, but for the sake of the exercise here, let's go ahead and, and flip to that plate and see what it is. So we'll flip over to that page. Now, again, I, I did this so many times. I don't even think, I mean, through college even, you know, when I was supposed to be using this correctly, I would just take an ID book and just kind of flip through it until I found something that seemed right, but that's not how you're supposed to use these. You're not supposed to just look at the plates or the pictures. You're supposed to use these charts and these descriptions as well. Another great thing about the Peterson Guide that I really like, and I, I guarantee we are not um, uh, sponsored by the Peterson Guide series. I would love to be if you know anybody who's there, but uh, until then, um, I'll just talk about it because it's a good guide. Uh, but we can see here all these details you know, really broke it out. So how many leaflets per leaf? Because again, these are all compound species. Are the twigs hairy? How big are they? What are the fruit like? Where's the habitat? All these very important details for us to figure out what we have are in that chart. And then you want to look at the plates after that. Um, but so if we're looking at our, our stats here, we're looking at the plates, you know, we remember our specimen, you know, uh, some of these are a possibility, especially white ash might be a possibility. Um, here we go. There's our specimen again, just for us to look at, but it really doesn't seem right. If it doesn't seem right, keep looking. So we'll go all the way back to the beginning. What's the next category down? Trees with opposite feather compound leaves. So, oh, it was the next plate over. Um, that's going to be the second ash plate and then ash leaf maple, whatever the heck ash leaf maple is. So we'll go back over there, check it out. Here we go. We're rolling through all these. And indeed, this ash leaf maple, um, three to five leaflets, uh, et cetera. I don't remember what these categories were, but, uh, and then we can look here. This is the only one of all these both opposite and compound leaves that had kind of lobing on the um, on the, the leaflets, not just a kind of very strictly serrated. We have all these little lobes and stuff. And um, if you know box elder, uh, some people call it poison ivy tree because the leaves kind of look like poison ivy. Don't those little kind of thumbs that come out there, those big lobes look like poison ivy. So this is Ashley's maple, is from Nagunda. So uh, this is not the end of your journey. Now the next step to kind of take your knowledge a little bit further, first of all, you, you want to make sure you have the right tree. So you got to double check here. So we want to go to the text, which is going to give us a bigger, more detailed description. But also, this is how you're going to learn about the species. So again, sounds painful, but you should read the book. You should read the book. After you figure out what it is, you should read the description of it. It's going to help you learn, again, this species' place um, in the forest. Um, and how to ID it. Um, so yeah, we'll read through uh, this description. The range maps are also incredibly, incredibly, incredibly valuable. Um, if you were doing this in California and you came up with ash leaf maple, mm -hmm, it's probably not your box elder. Um, so really important to look at these or kind of conversely, let me go back a slide here. If we're looking at this and we think it might be a Carolina ash and we're up in you know the Adirondacks of New York, you know, it's likely not. Uh, going to be that. So those range maps are super valuable in the process of elimination. So everything's lining up, all the description, the picture of the specimen, everything's lining up. But let's say you have your 4G reception here. You may as well look it up. Let's Google it one more time. Indeed, we have Box Elder, Acer Nagundo. Um, okay, so that's great. That's all fine, right? Uh, but, you know, what about winter? What about six months out of the year, half of our year? Uh, what the heck are you going to do? How are you going to identify these plants? Well, this is why you have to pay attention to everything and why you have to practice constantly. So when you figure out that tree, again, when you figure it out, your journey's not over. You don't close the book and keep walking. Then now it's time for you to look at the tree, knowing what its name is, knowing some of these processes about it and properties about it. Um, so if we identify, this is a black cherry here, Prunus serotonus. So if you figure it out by the leaf, um, now you can look at the bark. That is super distinctive bark that you are not really going to see on any other tree. Um, very dark, flaky, uh, really small kind of flaky plates. Um, very, very distinctive. And further south in the range, it doesn't really look like that, which is kind of interesting. Um, but up here in, in PA, especially kind of northern tier of PA, we get huge tall straight um, prunus serotonus. So they'll, they'll look very, very distinctive and stick out. 
So once you figure these things out, once you get to know the bark, now again, you got to practice. You got to look all over the place for this tree. Every time you're looking at trees, you got to think about that. Um, and you have to try to ID this species um, by the bark first in the future. This is how you start to ratchet your understanding up. And to kind of go back a little bit, just, you know, the, the, the dog slides, it's okay if you can't do this right away. You know, this is going to take a little while for you to build up, um, but eventually you'll get there and you'll never have to look up again. You'll know everything by the bark and uh, it'll be great. Your neck will be a lot happier with you. Um, so I wanted to really call out this identification book here, this bark book. Um, it is um, written for New England, uh, kind of like further Northeast uh, than here, but a lot of our species do overlap. So I recommend checking it out, maybe renting it from the library if you want to give it a give it a whack on a weekend. And if you like it enough, then you know go ahead and purchase it. This is another one that we um, do not get endorsements from, but man, I have uh, I think a lot of people have bought this book by my recommendation. So if anybody knows Michael. Um, give him my email address and, and we should talk sometime because um, I'd like to talk to him anyway. Seems like a cool guy because he structured this bark book very well. I have ne It's my favorite identification book because he has taken all the tree bark, uh, all the different forms, and he has broken it down into types that we can use to break things up. So the ridges and furrows, I honestly never really thought of that as a classification of bark types until I started reading this book. And then that's how he has the whole section. One sixth of all the trees are, you know, ridges and furrows. Others are plates. Um, others are, you know, uh, strips. And so, uh, yeah, he, it's just a really smart way of going about uh, learning your bark. So I recommend checking it out. Um, and again, um, uh, you know, really important to learn the bark. You're only gonna be able to see the leaves half the year. Now, if you are, um, you know, crazy, if you really want to just dive in feet first, I'm just going to throw this out there. No one does this, but think about starting to learn trees by their bark, because that is the more constant feature of those trees. Um, and it can tell us a lot about their ecology. If a, if a tree has very, very smooth bark, even when it's old, it's probably shade tolerant because it's probably, uh, it doesn't have thick bark potentially to assist in photosynthesis. If you have really thick bark, you're not gonna be able to do any photosynthesis you know, with that bark, but species like American beech that have really smooth bark, they are photosynthesizing under that bark tissue. Um, and they are a very slow growing shade tolerant species. So just like learning your leaves, learning other features, we can learn more about the ecology of these trees by learning their bark. So can't recommend it enough. Okay, that uh, we'll consider that drum beat. Um, so I had a couple slides in here just in case I didn't talk enough uh, to keep talking, but I think I'm going to stop talking now um, and, and open it up for questions and things. But really quickly here, we have American sycamore. This is my favorite tree, um, super distinctive bark. So I've heard people say that, um, well, it looks sick because of the bark. So that's why it's sycamore. If that's how you have to remember it, that's fine. But it doesn't look sick. It looks beautiful. Look at this thing. Um, these are, the, to me, this is the vertebrae of our uh, riparian forest. This is the backbone of our riparian forest. It's one of the most common species in our floodplains. Um, it grows super, super fast, lives a long time, 400 some years. Um, uh, I could talk all day about this tree, so I won't. Um, but in the middle of the winter, it's gleaming white up there in the crown um, above all of our streams. Love it. And it has all those um, uh, uh, fruit balls. Those, those are all akines, uh, sort of dried seeds within a little dispersal, uh, a little kind of nib uh, that disperses them. They have big leaves, really wonderful species. Uh, Northern red oak. Here's one that is a great one to start learning by the bark. Super, super distinctive bark. Look at those furrows, very smooth furrows. They go all the way down. Um, when I was taking uh, dendrology in college at North Carolina State University, uh, go Wolfpack, um, my dendrology professor did uh, most of his PhD work in kind of Maine and, and Canada. Um, and uh, he described these as ski trails in the bark. And as someone who grew up in the South, I had never seen a pair of skis before and I had no idea what he was talking about. But now I see uh, what he means here by these ski trails, like running down a mountain slope. Um, but nothing's going to look quite like that northern red oak. You can see it from hundreds of yards away. Um, and again, you don't even have to look up. And it can be tricky to identify the leaves and to tell them apart from scarlet oak, black oak, pin oak, um, and they can all hybridize. But the bark is very, very clear and distinctive, no matter what. Already alluded to this one, super, another one that's super easy to identify by a bunch of different features. Um, we've got that very smooth bark, kind of the smoothest bark around. Um, they also will hold on to their leaves really late. Um, into the autumn, so um, usually pretty easy to find them. Um, okay, so let's move on to questions. I think I'm going to close out my presentation, if that sounds good, Lauren, and stop sharing.
Great. Okay, and now I will pull up the questions. Okay, on my many, many tabs. Um, all right, so let me run through here. A um, lot of questions about identifying trees from their bark. So I'm super glad everybody's interested in it. And I'm super glad that I spent 40 minutes saying over and over and over again that you should learn uh, to ID these from the bark. So uh, one question here that's kind of interesting, <clears throat> are black locusts invasive? Um, so I get that question a good bit. I think because information online will say that they are in certain states, the state government considers them to be invasive, um, specifically Maine, uh, a couple other New England states, um, you know, not to um, start a fight with, you know, uh, the main Department of Natural Resources or whatever. But um, to me, the definition of an invasive plant is one that's, you know, not native to the region um, or uh, but causes an issue for regeneration and, and you know, ecosystem health. Um, I don't think black locust does that. It's just very aggressive and weedy. There's kind of a difference between an aggressive plant and an invasive plant. If it's aggressive and it spreads like crazy, um, but then you know, a hundred years later, it's not there anymore. That wasn't really necessarily an invasive plant. If it's something like multiflora rose or a native species like hyacinth fern that will take over in the understory of the forest and it will suppress regeneration and kind of alter these forest dynamics, that's an invasive plant. If you take a patch of hyacinth fern and don't manage it any way at all, but you come back in a hundred years, you're still just going to have that patch of hay-scented fern. If there's a little grove of black locusts and you come back in 100 years, um, you're, most of the black locusts are going to be dying and you're going to have a, kind of a sea of maples and other shade tolerant species kind of coming up underneath them. So I don't think that black locust is invasive. That's my answer and I'm sticking to it. And you can argue with me if you want. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, oh, very interesting. Um, Specific resources for kids learning to ID trees. Um, I do know that a lot of kids will watch my um, tree talk videos. I know um, a couple teachers have reached out to me that they'll, they'll play those in there. So, um, uh, but I think um, the best way is probably starting small um, with just a couple species that are common and that the kids are gonna see a lot. So like a black walnut, if there's like, you know, a black walnut at the edge of the playground or of the school or whatever, going there and, and looking at it all the time at different seasons and kind of gaining that acumen. And then you can walk around campus and try to find the black walnuts and kind of slowly building from there. I think that might be a good way to go about it. Um, I think it's just like any language, it's, it's immersion, right? So the more we can kind of practice, um, the better off we'll be. And then someday in 15, 20 years, this kid's going to be walking around and just say like, oh yeah, that's a black walnut over there. And someone will say, how do you know that? And they'll say, I don't know. Um, but it will be because of your hard work when they were in school. Um, so, okay, on to the, and I have one screen here, so I'm sorry, I have to keep toggling back and forth. Okay, I think I recommended some good tree ID books. Additionally, there's all sorts of other resources out there. I think, you know, the ones that I showed are kind of my go-tos that we usually will carry big boxes of when we do these in-person, you know, tree ID events, which we'll, we'll do again someday. Um, but there's a lot of other resources out there. So I recommend kind of looking at anything you can find and, and trying to see, you know, what works out best for you. Um, looking at uh, stuff in the library, um, when you go to a state park or something, you know, go into the office and see if they have any resources there and just check out stuff and explore stuff and, and kind of see what works for you. Um, I like things that are kind of small and easy to carry um, are the best. Um, so uh, phone apps, that's a really interesting question that I don't have a great answer to um, because I kind of got all my expertise in plant ID sort of before the advent of smartphones. I kind of have never really used them. Um, I've never really found an app that I've liked. Um, and so I just kind of stuck to keys. So I'm old school and I use books um, for my ID stuff, but um, that doesn't mean there's not great apps out there. I know a lot of people use a lot of them. I know a lot of people use iNaturalist, which is kind of crowd sourced, which is kind of cool. Um, but um, yeah, so sorry, I don't have a great answer to that. Um, don't forget your print media. Um, it's always there for you. Um, okay, so someone did ask about white oaks and habitat uh, type um, kind of associations. That is a really interesting question. I think I'm going to circle back to that if I have time on that. Um, here's another really interesting one. Should I leave non-native trees growing around my stream? Um, I would say the answer is it depends. Depends on what the species is, depends on how big it is. Um, 
you know, a good rule of thumb is if it's not native, you know, and it's replaceable within the next couple of years, then definitely go ahead and remove it properly and replace it with something native. Um, but if you have a massive, you know, hundred year old Norway maple on the bank of a creek and it's holding the bank in, I would probably leave that because it's not super invasive. It, it does spread, but it's not too, too bad or like a Norway spruce or something. But even if it was a massive tree of heaven, and it was on the banks of a, a creek and it was the only tree around, I would still kill it. I'd kill it dead um, because it's gonna spread really, really aggressively and, and be a problem. Um, and especially on streams, we have to kind of be cognizant of the fact that it's gonna put all its seed in the stream and float downstream. So we need to be very careful to make sure that we're, um, you know, keeping our riparian forests as native as possible. Um, uh, but again, you gotta make sure that you're ready to replace those. Um, after they're done, uh, after you're done removing the invasives. Um, okay, I got a notification for my next meeting that starts at one, so I know we're running out of time, but I'm gonna keep running through these if that's cool with everybody, um, but I definitely won't be offended if people pop off and have to go on to their next things. Um, okay, back to my list, there we go. I got a little bubble here, I could see the screen and my question list at once. Okay, bark, 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 love it. Here's a cool, really interesting one. Um, what is the future impact of climate change on central PA's forest and what types of trees should we be planting to weather the impact? I think about this all the time while we're doing reforestation. I kind of consider our reforestation work to be super important um, in kind of climate change uh, uh, resilience because if you think back thousands of years when a lot of PA and New York was glaciated, species were moving. You know, as the glaciers started to recede, things started to move, but we didn't have neighborhoods and roads and developments and agriculture and like all this kind of human junk in the way. So things could move. A squirrel could take that oak acorn and run a hundred yards away and bury it. And then an oak grows there and things can kind of move. Now we don't really have that kind of um, free movement of plant material necessarily. So it is incumbent on us while we are moving plant material to think about this and to make sure that we are trying to build resilient forests. So what I do, I've started to kind of really reduce the species that are more northerly, even when I love them. You know, aspens, love aspens. I love aspens so much, but um, they're not going to be super happy in southern PA for very much longer. So um, we are planting southern species. We're planting sweet guns. We're planting bald cypress even a little bit. Um, we're planting a lot of stuff um, that's very happy in kind of mid-Atlantic, uh, a little bit further south even, um, with the hopes that, you know, they will survive. The problem is in 50 or so years, it's going to be perfect conditions <clears throat> here for them, but it's not necessarily in the next like five. So I wouldn't recommend going whole hog and planting like an entire North Carolina forest uh, up here. Um, although you could do that because chestnut oaks and <laughs> tulip poplars and most of the species are gonna be the same, but we can make those tweaks around the edges um, to accommodate the, uh, the climate change. Um, okay, so let's see, let's see. Tree of heaven, yes, strong smell. Again, use all of your um, your clues available to you um, for identification. All of your senses, except maybe taste, hold back on that. Um, so yeah, a uh, question about elderberries being invasive. That's interesting. So um, that might come from that same kind of question of the black locust, um, just a perception because they're very, very weedy, but uh, they are indeed native. So we actually have two native elderberry species here in the east. We have our uh, uh, um, black elderberry, uh, Sambucus canadensis, um, which is kind of the purpley one that you've seen in the open, very shrubby and big. And then we have a more kind of dainty, delicate one um, that I am blanking on the name now. It's red elderberry. I think it might be Sambucus rubra or something like that, but that's just a guess. And that's actually a shade tolerant one. So if you're on a hike and you're in the middle of the woods and you find an elderberry next to a creek, and it's kind of small and dainty and doesn't really look like those big crazy shrubs that we see out in the open um, that might be our other native elderberry species. Um, they also fruit a little bit differently. Their inflorescence is different. Um, they don't have those big kind of flat crowns of flowers and fruits. There's more of a spike that's kind of towards the top of the, of the stems. Um, okay, opposite leaves. Okay, so question is, uh, when a tree has opposite leaves, will that opposite structure continue with the twigs and branches in all cases? The answer is yes. However, again, you might have a storm or a squirrel or something break a stem off. So you wanna still be careful when you're looking up. Um, if you see like three or four opposite uh, stems, 
you've got an opposite pair. But if you just see one, it might be a trick of the eye. Um, and if you uh, uh, aren't seeing any, that's you know probably alternate. But um, yeah, just something to keep in mind. Um, okay, interesting question. Why are oaks not living very long? I heard it's a kind of fungus in the soil. This is another climate change question, actually, unfortunately. So um, a lot of oaks, especially in urbanized areas, are just kind of dropping like flies. Um, in those same areas, so let's say you know, you're in Northern Virginia uh, and you have a yard tree, uh, a 75 year old oak that should have a couple hundred more you know, years to its life, but it's dying now. Um, if you go to a forested area in that exact same town and you find a red oak that's the same age, it's probably doing a lot healthier. What's happening is, well, this is how species um, ranges change over time due to climate change. Um, we have all these stresses on all the plants um, every single plant species is, is under stress at all times. Environmental stresses is just the nature of you know, nature. Um, but with climate change, now in addition to all those stresses like fungus and viral infections and insects and cicadas and all this other stuff and soil compaction, like you name it, we also have these unpredictable weather patterns um, weather that is not like it's been for, you know, millennia here. Um, uh, we have all these fluctuations. Sometimes it's too dry, sometimes it's too wet. And so all of these things are stressing the plants out further so that other stresses can get a toehold and start to kind of cause destruction. So it, it is oftentimes a fungus that's killing the tree, but it's because it's super stressed out due to um, climate change, mostly. Same with a lot of other insect diseases and pests, even, you know, hemlock woolly adelgid, the little insect that's killing our hemlock trees. Um, in, you know, in, in New northern New York, it's not much of a problem yet, um, but it's going to be in, you know, 50 years because of climate change. Um, it's a little bit colder up there, and those cold winters keep the, the insect at bay. So, yeah, very interesting and good question. Um, okay, what's the best way to kill Ilanthus seedlings that are connected to a big tree in your neighbor's yard. Yeah, this is the um, uh, hard part about um, land management, right? Is that um, uh, land is not, nature doesn't have boundaries, um, but we put boundaries on everything and, and that's what the laws are. And so, um, uh, oh, I just saw in the chat, uh, Sambucus racemosa. Yeah, thank you. I haven't verified that, but that sounds right for the red elderberry. Um, yeah, so, it, it, you know, obviously you can't just walk over and spray. Uh, uh, your your neighbor's tree of heaven, I think you're going to have to knock on the door and ask them about it. Um, because if it is connected by the root, you can spray uh, foliar herbicide on your, you know, seedling that's coming up, it, but it's not going to stop the problem. It's just going to kill that little seedling. So kind of a couple ways you can go about it is you can just kind of protect your um, property and just keep the invasives out of it. That's kind of what I do. Um, all my neighbors have a lot of uh, Japanese honeysuckle and porcelain berry and stuff. And all I can do is just kind of keep it from encroaching into my yard because I can't manage their yards for them. Um, so, but the best thing to do would be to have that conversation and try to, you know, help out with them to provide info so that they can kill it. And depending on where you are, there might be actually resources available to help kill that um, from like a county government or something with a spot of lamp and fly because that's a, a primary host plant for those little guys. Um, okay, so I know there's more questions and stuff, but I think we have to stop eventually and now seems like a good time. So thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate all your time and, and staying a little bit longer with this. I know you have another meeting to hop off to, but um, this session was recorded and I will be sharing it with you all probably tomorrow morning, but um, Brian did share his email. I'll include it in my follow-up email to you all tomorrow morning in case you have extra specific questions that you want to ask of Ryan, but I just want to say, Ryan, thank you so much on behalf of the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. I'm, I'm so happy that you all were able to join us today. Um, yeah, just really appreciate everyone's time. Thanks again, Ryan. Take care, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your summer. Bye.